Und jetzt ist Schlag in den All those titles really mean is I've been a member of the pub for a long time. <laughs> All right. As in past years, the way I do this show is um, I read a lot of astronomy news and space news. And whenever I see something interesting, I drop it in a folder. And I also write down the article that I got it from. So if you go to this particular web page, you will find this entire presentation with all the slides and all the articles connected to it. So if you have any question, about any of the slides, and I don't know the answer, you can find out that way. All right, we're starting here. This is a 17 pound meteorite found in Antarctica. They do a search in Antarctica for meteorites every year. This is the largest found in five years. This is the El Ali meteorite. This is a 15.2 ton iron found in 2020. Inside it, they found two new minerals, minerals that can't be created in Earth's gravity. And somebody's cell phone. It's all right, these things always happen. This is Roxy's doghouse. <laughs> it's got a little hole in it. Roxy's doghouse went for $20,000, and the meteorite that hit it went for an undisclosed account. Roxy was not in the doghouse at the time. <laughs> Farmer Mick, Meyer, Mick Miners in North Southwest Australia found this strange tree sitting in his field. What this turns out to be is turns, turns out to be a second stage of a SpaceX booster, <laughs> which somehow landed engine down in his field. So yes, things up there do come back down again. We had a skimmer. Um, this is over Utah on August 14th. It bounced off the atmosphere and kept on going. This is a big fireball that came in over Texas at 3 a.m. And this is the one that went right over us Whoa. on November 19th, 2022 at 3.30 a.m. It was actually seen in space before it re-entered. And I've got a cool video of this thing passing the CN Tower. This is actually a doorbell camera. This is actually, sorry. It's actually an all sky camera that somebody had. Um, pieces of it landed in near, um, it's the other side of London, Ontario. I can't remember the name of town right now. Okay. Washburn fire, burning the giant sequoias, July 10th. The Nord Stream gas pipeline. Somebody dropped some bombs on it. Fortunately, there was no gas in it at the time. It was filled with air. But as you can see from the satellite view, it was filled with air. This is satellite view. What's the scale? Um, it'd be in the article. So if you take a look at the article later on, it'll tell you. <clears throat> Mauna Loa in infrared from Landsat 9, showing a nice lava flow. Snow in Hawaii. Yeah. You saw that? I was there. You were there. As it was melting. Okay. Not a common event in Hawaii, to say the least. <clears throat> this is the result of the magnitude seven twenteen of the magnitude seven point eight earthquake in Turkey that happened on February sixth. It created this fissure. 190 miles long. And what this is, is this is a Doppler scan. So one side up, the other side down? Yep. For the third year in a row, La Nina, it finally
finally died just this year, which is why we get all the rains in uh, California. But it used to be that we had La Ninas and El Ninos once and then a break and then another break and now they're happening year after year after year. Category four, Hurricane Ian, Ian, I-A-N, September 27th and September 28th, passing right over top of Florida. Now this one's a scary one. This is Tropical Cyclone Freddy from February 6th. This guy was only a Category 3 storm, but it started on one side of the Indian Ocean, went all the way to the other side of the Indian Ocean, bounced and started coming back <clears throat> before it died. Only one other storm has ever lived this long. And the nightmare scenario is if it, the ocean stays warm enough, it just goes round and round and round and doesn't stop. CO2 levels have finally hit 420 parts per million. That's a 100 parts per million rise since 1960. Note that in the 1950s, they used to pump greenhouses up to 420 to make the plants grow better. Don't need to do that anymore. Fire at Kitt Peak, 617. <clears throat> the last flight of Sophia, now permanently grounded. The European Nimoa array in the French Alps, finally reaching full capacity of 12 antennas. This is a new radio observatory. And the Deep Space Network, adding DSS-53, which means we're now up to 14 antennas in the Deep Space Network. This is a network talking to probes out in space. Where is this located? This is another one in Spain. So Spain has five, sorry, Spain has seven, and the others have four each. Okay, spin launch, and I've got a video of this for you guys. The idea is to take a projector, to take a projectile, get it spinning really, really fast, and then send it out the top. And this is actually a shot of the launch site from spin launch. Strato launch did acceptive, did its second captive carry test. <clears throat> this is what you get if you buy two 747s, pick them apart and put them back together again as one giant airplane. This is an experiment called Lofted. The idea behind Lofted is a reentry capsule for Mars. And it's just basically a giant balloon. All they do is they put the payload inside the balloon, inflate it, and the experiment with this was actually designed to mimic what Mars as atmosphere would do to the thing when it landed. <clears throat> this is an idea for a much cheaper reentry method on Mars. Long March 5B, re-entering over India. The uh, <clears throat> Chinese don't seem to care where their uh, stuff re-enters anymore. <clears throat> First successful launch of Firefly, which is a spinoff of SpaceX. And what these guys are doing is these guys are looking at the medium launch. Can you see my mouse here? This is Firefly. And these are all the contenders for the medium-sized launch facility. SpaceX, of course, is one of the big guys. Okay, how's my pace, guys? All right, the 200th launch of a SpaceX Falcon 9, February 3rd, 2023. They're launching more than one a week now. 
they've got the price per launch down so low that people are actually launching things they know won't work just to experiment. <laughs> I kid you not. <laughs> Starlink V2. The new Starlinks are 20% brighter than the V1s. And they're going to be launching thousands of these things. The new Starlink V2s actually use laser comms to communicate with each other. Uh, right now, there's a 100 millisecond delay after you hit the button to go all the way up to your Starlink satellite and all the way down to your internet location. They're going to fix that with laser comms, and they're hoping to get uh, 1.250 terabyte links on their ground stations <coughs> when they're fully configured, which is way beyond fiber. We'll see how they do that. Here we have the first Falcon Heavy launch in three years, launching US um, Space Force number 44. <clears throat> and here's the one that just launched sitting in the hangar, giving you an idea how big this thing is. This is a wonderful explosion that happened uh, while they were testing the booster for the Falcon Heavy, or sorry, for the Falcon Starship. The thing literally exploded on the pad, but didn't cause any serious damage. The liftoff, however, did. <laughs> <clears throat> the liftoff, when the thing took off, it literally broke the pad. And it's thought that that caused this to happen. You notice all the lights aren't lit. And then it started to wobble, so they made it go boom. And it was ground control that actually uh, hit the button to destroy it. Because they were worried it would wobble off and try to head towards Louisiana. Okay, our next step up. The Boeing Starliner finally got launched. <clears throat> After a six-month delay sitting on the pad, and is six years behind schedule, Boeing has finally launched their attempt to send people up to the International Space Station. And here we have Starliner finally docked with the International Space Station. This is a Cygnus cargo drone known as, called Selly Rye, uh, launched from Virginia on 11-7. And notice that one of the solar panels didn't deploy. Soyuz MS-22 had a coolant leak on December 14th. It turned out that that coolant leak turned out to be a meteorite hit. And there's the hole. It was doomed unsuitable to be used, so it's been jettisoned and it's going to be replaced. But because of that, some astronauts had a little bit of extra time. <laughs> this is Scott Kelly in a gorilla suit. Uh, what he did is he got into the Cygnus drone and he hid in one of the cargo containers. And when one of the astronauts came in to open up the cargo container, he came out. <laughs> <clears throat> and I've got a cool video of it that he took on ISS that I can show you guys later. <laughs> This is Urea Chrysalid, a film actress who spent 12 days up on ISS taking shots of her latest movie. And our current view of ISS from the bottom. Notice the Cygnus cargo drone attached to it. Here we have the Chinese Tiangong or Celestial Temple, and, oh, I don't have a laser pointer. I was looking for one earlier. The object in the middle on the right-hand side that's attached to it, that's the new module that they just put up there, and here they are attaching it. All right. 
we had a micrometeorite hit on the James Webb Space Telescope before and after. You can see the hole in the lower right segment. But focus is still pretty good. Spitzer in infrared on the left and James Webb on the right. This is a dust cloud and a large Magellanic cloud. All right, Artemis 1 did its first test flight. Now, when you look at the Artemis 1 mission and you see the orange booster up there and the two solid rocket boosters and you think space shuttle, you're right. The four rockets that are sitting in the bottom of that orange cone are actually refugees from the shuttle program. In two cases, they were taken right out of museums. The next shot of Artemis also has two museum boosters, but there are two new boosters. And of those two new boosters, pieces of them were also taken out of existing shuttles. So yes, this is a shuttle rehash. Artemis 1 in the moon, or, sorry, Artemis 1 in the Earth, in the Earth and moon. Okay. This is Capstone. Capstone was following Artemis. It's just a CubeSat. But the idea behind Capstone was it was going to go into the orbit of the proposed lunar space station. And here we have a shot from the Japanese lander, which crashed on August 25th of the Earth and the moon. Oh, 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 yeah. Go back. Go back. Oh, yes. I forgot the eclipse. Yes. If you take a careful look, there was an eclipse that day. If you take a careful look at the Earth over Australia, there's a little black spot. Korean Pathfinder. Lunar Orbiter, here's another image of the Earth and the Moon from the Korean Pathfinder. Also launched on a Falcon 9. And this is a rocket body that struck the Moon on March 4th, 2022. We're still not exactly sure where it came from, but it's thought to be something that fell out of Earth orbit and then got recaptured by Earth orbit. And if you look very closely at it, you can actually see it sort of looks like a rocket body sitting there in that fresh crater. Diachi Fuji was taking a picture of a crescent moon and he caught this. See that little spot on the moon on the lower right? That's actually an impact. He caught a lunar impact while he was swimming the moon. This is a pit in the Sea of Tranquility. What this is, is this is a skylight for a lava tube. It turns out that the bottom of this lava tube is a nice, comfortable 63 degrees, no matter what phase of the moon you're in. And there's enough space here to actually protect you from solar radiation in the lava tube. And that's the Sea of Tranquility, mind you. The, chi the uh, China's Yatu-2 rover is still making donuts in the moon four years later. And our next step, the Parker Solar Pro caught this thing called a hedgehog on the sun. You can see it on the upper right. And this was March 27th. We're halfway through, guys. Venus, looking at old Magellan data from Matt's Mons, they found this. This is a live lava flow. 
that happened between two different orbits of the Magellan probe. It was thought up until just now that Venus was dead, but it's got live active volcanoes on it. James Webb Space Telescope image of Mars, measuring its atmosphere. And yeah, you're going to see a lot of James Webb Space Telescope images. The UAE probe HOPE was designed to take a look at the surface composition of Mars. And when it was all done with its mission, it decided to take a nice close look at Deimos. And it found something really, really weird. It was thought that Deimos and Phobos were captured asteroids. It turns out they're not. The surface of Deimos and Phobos is actually made out of the same stuff as the surface of Mars, which means the origin of the moons of Mars is probably similar to the origin of our moon, meaning that they're a piece of Mars. There's a whole fleet of, air, of craft currently orbiting Mars. From upper right to lower left, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, MAVEN, Odyssey, EXPRESS, and TGO. Taking pictures on Mars, this is Storthium Kasbon Mars, which is where I told you the ice deposit was found last year. And the ice deposit is the lower left-hand corner here. Dust storm on Mars. This is cool. Uh, Mars Express found this. This is a glacial moraine. The remains of a glacier on the surface of Mars. Tectonic plates on Mars. And here we have a Mars Express shot of Deimos with Jupiter in the background. Mars Insight recorded a Mars quake at 5.0. And there's the quake. And this appears to be what caused it. About 2,000 miles away from where the uh, Mars Insight rover was sitting was where this guy happened. It impact on Mars. The path of the Curiosity rover on Mars. This is what 10 years on Mars can do to your tires. <laughs> How many people have ever seen this image before? Anybody? OK, I don't really go fishing for these things. They get sent to me. <laughs> OK, doesn't that look like a mine shaft? Turns out that this is a. No, it's not a mine shaft. It's only about two feet high. Uh, this is uh, from May 7th. And this is a natural formation. And they got these things sticking out of the ground. Uh, these are called the fingers. They're also thought to be leftovers from erosion. And these are all shots from Curiosity. Doesn't that look like a chicken thigh bone? I swear that that's a chicken thigh bone, but it's not chicken thigh bone, that's on Mars. The dragon spine, shot from Curiosity rover. Once again, weird things are weathering out. And a meteorite called Cocoa. Notice the lack of rust. The surface of Mars. All right. The other rover is the Perseverance rover. Perseverance, this is its path, and this is also the path of Ingenuity, its helicopter. And you notice they're pretty much basically side by side. Here we have Ingenuity after its 50th flight on the surface of Mars. Now, this is something that they were worried would never even be able to take off. They're using it as a scout. 
Check out this balanced boulder. Perseverance. This was scary. This is strain. It turns out to be from Perseverance's own parachute. <laughs> and clouds on Mars. Okay, we had a cool comet. This greenish glow came from Comet ZTF, found in February of last year. Uh, I got a good look at it. We actually got a good look on the cave of this one, too, for a while. Anybody else saw it? Anybody? Yeah. Yes, we had a few ZTFs here. This guy was actually naked eye for a little while, but you had to have a good night. In February, there weren't many of those. Dart, first image of Didymos. Here we have a Hubble Space Telescope image of Didymos after Dart hit it. And I've got a cool video to show you two of this one. This is actually taken by an amateur, uh, Rafa Ferrando. He's a guy that regularly submits images to my supernova page. And this is a shot from the probe that was following Didymos called Like a Cube. And you can see Didymos and the amorphous here. Didymos is the one on the right that got smashed. James Webb Space Telescope shot of 10199 Chicago, which is a main belt asteroid passing near a star. It turns out that this asteroid has a ring. The surface of asteroid Ryugu. This is actually taken last year, but it wasn't uh, released until they got their um, their sample and return mission done. This is asteroid Circe passing in front of Mizzy A100. Ceres? Siri, one Siri, yes. James Webb Space Telescope image of Jupiter. You can tell James Webb images by the star patterns. The stars that are overexposed have two superimposed X's going through them, whereas the, the Hubble Space Telescope ones have one X. And that's actually caused by the secondary mirror. Note the ring on Jupiter. Hubble Space Telescope shot of Jupiter. This is taken three months apart. It gives you an idea. These relative sizes are correct, too. It gives you an idea how much we move in our orbit and how Jupiter appears to be bigger and smaller. We are now up to 92 moons on Jupiter, making it having more moons than Saturn, as well as a wrong way window. One of the outer moons is actually going the wrong way. Juno probe with Ganymede shadow, casting a shadow on the surface of Jupiter. Juno probe close up of Europa. Check out the ice. Here we have the just launched Jupiter Icy Moon Explorer from the European Space Agency, launched April 13th, and it's currently having problems deploying its radar. And here we have the to be launched Europa Clipper, due for launch on October 6th, also to Europa. Now it turns out Europa Clipper is going to get there a lot faster then Juice is going to get there. And the reason is because Europa Clipper is going to be launching a Falcon Heavy. This is an idea for exploring underneath all that ice in Europa. There are two competing ways for getting these little probes down there. There's the European way, which is to drop a little bitty lander on the surface and have a heater in it and have the heater slowly melt its way down through all the ice. 
And then there's the US idea, which is to use a bunker buster. <laughs> All right, Saturn, an ultraviolet from the Hubble Space Telescope. Titan from the James Webb Space Telescope. James Webb can cut through the clouds on Titan. Uranus, James Webb Space Telescope. Check out the rings. Yeah. Neptune, James Webb Space Telescope. Okay. Minor planet Humane was also found to have a, a ring as well as two moons. And yes, this is a graphic. But that gets us out of our solar system and into deep space. The pillars of creation with Hubble Space Telescope on the bottom and James Webb on the top. That is what the James Webb Telescope image of the pillars of creation looks like. And I warn you, this image is very big. It makes a really cool backdrop on a cell phone, too. All right. Protostar L1527, James Webb Space Telescope shot. Star WR140. This is a massive type O star, which is puffing out its outer layers. That's not a visual artifact. Right. That's not a visual art. This is a real image from James Webb. 30 Doradus in the Tarantula Nebula, James Webb. And by the way, a lot of these images we see from the James Webb Space Telescope are actually processed by an amateur whose name is Judy Schmidt. Citizen scientist, yes. right? Yes, she's a citizen scientist. She actually processed most of these images. Uh, the James Webb Space Telescope is doing something similar to what Hubble is doing now, where they're actually publishing all the results and they're not sequestering them for six months so that science can look at them. Um, after the Voyager probe happened, uh, a citizen scientist got a hold of the raw data and found two moons. And after that, all images from deep space probes were sequestered for a period of time because the PhD didn't like the idea of an amateur discovering moons around a planet that he was supposed to have discovered them on. Well, such is life. Okay, James Webb shot. Uh, PA30. This is thought to be a supernova remnant from 1181 AD. And this is Messier 1 from the new X IXPE observatory, which is a new X-ray observatory that got launched last year. WR-125, 1,500 light years away from Earth and pointed right at us. This guy could go supernova at any time. Also James Webb Space Telescope. People remember the dimming of Betelgeuse from year before last. Yeah. This is what the current theory is on what happened. Betelgeuse puffed out something. That something darkened and then passed in front of the surface of Betelgeuse. Sagittarius A star in the middle of our galaxy. This is a superimposed image, but I thought it looked really cool from May 5th. Here we have radio waves. This is what the center of our galaxy looks like in radio waves with Sagittarius A star, which is the supernova, sorry, which is the black hole in the core of our galaxy. And a close up. These are called Fermi bubbles. 
And this is something that I just found out about recently. It turns out that there's an antimatter <coughs> detector on board the International Space Station. And it's getting lots of hits. The thought is, is that our galaxy's, super, our galaxy's black hole was active. And what it was doing was it was pushing both matter and antimatter from the core of the galaxy out towards us. And that some of these meteorites that are hitting us are actually antimatter. They're very small quantities, but they are indeed antimatter. Fortunately, mostly antiprotons, which are pretty small. All right, microlensing. This is two stars passing in front of each other. The effect of a star passing in front of a black hole is a microlensing event, where you see the star, then the star looks badly warped, as in a badly warped lens, and then it goes back again. But what's happened is, is the Hubble Space Telescope has actually watched this happen with two stars where we have two stars, one passing in front of the other over the years. And you see this starts in 2019 and goes on to the ship. It turns out that beyond the zone of avoidance, which is basically what we're looking at at the core of our galaxy, is another nearby large galactic cluster, similar to that of the Virgo cluster. We just can't see it because it's on the other side of our galaxy from us. The Jellyfish Galaxy, Hubble Space Telescope image, GW100. Images of dwarf galaxies from the James Webb Space Telescope. And yeah, we're almost done, guys. Globular clusters in other galaxies, James Webb Space Telescope. <laughs> From the Very Large Telescope, the VLT, NGC 7727, two black holes slowly merging in the core. This is a shot of supernova 2021 AFDX in the famous Cartwheel Galaxy. This is one of the first shots that was published from James Webb Space Telescope, and it caught this supernova at the very end. If you remember the Cartwheel Galaxy, the Cartwheel Galaxy is a giant wheel, and this is one quarter of the wheel. Gamma Ray Burst 221009A, called BOAT. This is the brightest gamma ray burst ever recorded. James Webb Space Telescope. Deep field image, galaxy cluster SMAC 07223. Note these very, very distant red galaxies. Here we have another shot of it. Now it turns out that these guys are showing up to be about 13 and a half billion years old. Now, the universe is thought to be 13.7 billion years old. The problem is, is that when they look at the spectrum of these guys in radio waves, they see stuff that comes from generation two stars. Well, it's thought that it takes about 500 million years to make a generation two star, which means that these galaxies must have formed before the universe did. which kind of throws a big hole in the way our current theory works of the universe works. And that is my show, guys. Yay.
And you want to see some videos? All right, how do I get at this guy here? Can I move him down? Can I move him up? Aha, I can move him down. All right. So all I have to do then is I have to double click on this. And this is what you'll see on the website. And please forgive all of my typos because I do this very quickly when I see one, I just add it. And then I try to organize them in some sort of same fashion lately. Uh, here's Scott Kelly in his gorilla suit. Want to see that? Now let's see how the uh, music works. Nope, got to share sound. No, I think I need to do it from here. Yeah, we're dropped out of share screen. Oh, you're right. Share screen. Another share screen there. The green at the bottom. Bottom bar there. Okay, I don't have a bottom bar. Yeah. Well, you gotta look at the projection. I have this one up here, and it says share sound, so I'm already sharing sound. So I'm sharing sound. If he unmutes, we're gonna get a lot of feedback. All right. Yeah, we'll do it without the sound, then, guys. Maybe if Craig mutes first.
Dave, I think you're muted. Can you hear me now? No. Nope. Don't want to do that. Are you muted? You're good. Now, okay. Dave. Once it gets to fairly close to the speed of sound, they let it go. And unfortunately, when they let it go, it had a little bit of a spin left. <clears throat> but the idea basically is to set one of these at basically a 23 degree angle on a mountainside somewhere and get it going so fast they can actually launch it into orbit. <laughs> but I hate to think of the number of Gs. <laughs> Remember that solar flare I showed you? And the Earth is there for size in the upper right, if you can see it. <laughs> okay, guys. With that, we will call it a meeting. I'll be around for a while if you guys want to watch any more videos. But I think that our people at, well, actually, it's not as bad as I thought. It's only quarter to nine. Well, I'll give it back to you, Tony.